Hello, and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Richard Griscom, and I am the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat window of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or you can use the raise hand function in the participants window if you would like to contribute a comment or question using your microphone after the presentation has finished. Today's speaker is Hannah Gibson. Hannah is a lecturer at the Department of Language and Linguistics at the University of Essex, and she researches linguistic variation and change with a special focus on the syntax and semantics of Bantu languages in Eastern and Southern Africa. Hannah is a co-investigator of three ongoing and upcoming projects, including a project on um, local language and literacy practices to enhance classroom learning and achievement, variation in Sesotho and Setswana as spoken in the Free State, and dialectology in Bantu languages, variation in Bemba across phonology and morphosyntax. Please join me in welcoming Hannah as she gives her presentation, Beyond Word Order, Rangi and Comparative Perspective. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Thanks for the introduction, Richard. Um, I uh, panicked for a moment, wondering what all of my projects were. Um, but yeah, that's a very nice uh, reminder of other, other things that, um, some of which are, are related, but other things to, to think about as well. Um, so yeah, uh, beyond word order, Rangi and comparative perspective, I'm just going to um, dive right in. Um, and I've got a little bit of an introduction. I'm kind of conscious of uh, several of you who are here who've heard me uh, speak in other, other places on some of these topics, but I'm going to try and bring all of these things together and then point out some possible future directions as well. So here, just to say that um, Rangi has come to the attention of linguists due to a number of uh, unusual features, um, features that the language has that are kind of unusual or marked either from a comparative perspective or a typological perspective, or actually indeed both. Um, and then most widely noted, but I mean, that's really because that's what I've spent <laughs> so much of my life thinking about and working on um, is this verb auxiliary order, but I was by no way the, the, you know, the, the first person to, to note this. Um, so that's sort of one of the things that um, people kind of know it for. So that's where this idea in the title comes from beyond word order. Um, and what I want to do today is really kind of highlight, I suppose, that there are some other features that cause the language to stand out or that are also worthy of exploration and examination. And really for that, I'm bringing, drawing on some previous work that I've done and, and um, lots of that's collaborative work with other people. But I also kind of want to pose a question really, which is to what extent these kind of unusual features give us an accurate, so a correct or completely incorrect picture of the language overall. And that's really a kind of methodological question, um, really, or a question in terms of how we approach things. And I, I'm particularly interested in what people in this group think about that, both drawing on people's extensive experience and knowledge of languages of, of the Rift area, but also across um, Bantu languages or comparative work more broadly. So the aim really is to build on some previous work uh, that looked at Rangi word order, but I will talk a little bit about this just to set that backdrop um, for, for, for some folk who may not um, know so much about that work. Um, but what I want to do then is to situate our understanding within a broader kind of comparative Bantu perspective. So I'm gonna highlight a few features, um, other features that I found in Rangi in a bit more detail, also just to show some, some data and so we can kind of look at some examples and things. Um, and then I want to sort of open out to this kind of broader question that I've already already highlighted, really. How do we situate Rangi in a wider comparative context? And I will be drawing really here on sort of syntax and morphosyntax. There may be other people who would highlight you know, aspects of, of phonology or broader um, features, which again, um, we sort of discussed in some of the Rift Valley work. Um, but yeah, I will be kind of focusing really on the domain of, of morphosyntax. So a little bit of a, a roadmap, I just want to provide a bit of a background um, on the language, um, highlight some kind of previous work, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the um, Bantu Morphosyntactic Variation Database and a related project 
that I've been involved in and then try and situate Rangi against that backdrop. Um, so this is a kind of comparative uh, perspective. And then it will be a summary really rather than conclusions and then suggestions for future direction and, and yeah, lots more work to be done. Um, so just sort of, yeah, so we know where we, we are and where we're talking about. Um, so Rangi spoken in and around an area of Kondoa town, so central Tanzania, Kondoa district, um, kind of on the, <laughs> on the road between Dodoma and Arusha, um, on the road between lots of other places um, in, central, in central Tanzania. Um, and as we know, and really this series is doing fantastic work to highlight this, um, an area with a sustained history of language contact and actually my, my personal story is that's how I ended up working on Rangi. So when I was a, a student, um, I was really interested in language contact and I'm, I'm still very interested in language contact. And when I was looking for a topic, um, someone had sort of said, oh, Rangi would be an interesting language to look at because it seems to have lots of features which are the result of language contact. So I started looking at, at it from that perspective and what you have against, you know, this is a broader backdrop of high levels of bilingualism um, language shift going on actually for a very long period of time. And then from the contact perspective, this really interesting feature of this part of, of Tanzania and of the Rift Valley, that you have um, contact between languages from distinct language families and indeed language phyla. So really the only place where you find these kind of groups all in one, all in one place. And so I thought that was also interesting from a contact perspective in terms of what changes do or, or don't take place. Um, a little a little map just to sort of zoom zoom in on here. So this is from the, the Burungay grammar and this is um, the neighbours of the Burungay, but I mean in our case or my case this is also the neighbours of the Rangi speakers. So Rangi's in, in the middle, um, but then you can just see even impressionistically from this map that you have, you know, Gorwa, Alagwa, um, Sandawe, Burungay, Mbugwe, Iraq, Hadza, um, and, you know, and there's lots of other languages there that are, you know, not highlighted. I mean, obviously Swahili is also present. Um, and yeah, the kind of language ecology, the linguistic ecology, really, um, yeah, really sort of uh, interesting and diverse. And so Kondoa town is in the middle of that. And then most of my research and data collection was, was done in Haubi, which is um, also sort of part of um, one of the dots on the map in the middle of the, the Rangi area. Um, and then as you can see to the right of that, you have kind of Maasai. So the other side of the hills goes down to the, 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 the Maasai on the, on the other side. Um, and then kind of Chigogo down into to Doma. Um, um, in terms of just kind of, I suppose, vital statistics um, for the language. Um, so somewhere in the region of 400,000 speakers, um, depending on how and who you count um, and also when your numbers were from. Um, centered around Kondoa district and indeed Kondoa town. And then I haven't worked much on variation. So this is very much what was reported to me, but they have these kind of described um, two, two varieties of Rangi, if you want a kind of high Rangi and a low Rangi. Um, and I only say this because I think it's, it's funny that this high Rangi is spoken in Halby. So that's where most of the work that I did um, uh, is, sorry, that most of the research I did took place there. Um, and what people distinguish between basically is how be and everywhere else. Um, so that might be kind of considered a, a prestigious variety if you want, um, but actually increasing levels of, of mobility and perhaps um, these kind of distinctions that may well already be um, out of date. And then Kondoa town, because it's a town, because lots of people will have studied there, traveled there a lot, lived there, um, also very widely kind of understood or perhaps assuming some kind of standard Rangi, if you were if you were thinking that such a thing exists, might be more likely based on the Kondoa variety now um, than, than the Halby variety. Um, so moving sort of more to the structure of the language, I suppose, um, this slide really is to tell you that it does what we would expect of a well-behaved Bantu language, dominant SVO word order with variant word orders available for pragmatic purposes, um, head marking morphology, um, tone, noun classes, agreement everywhere, um, verbal extensions, some of which are valency changing, um, and then also some evidence of lexical borrowing from these neighboring languages um, and some sort of sign, at least in that realm of, of language contact, um, borrowed into the, into the lexicon. Um, so these are examples that if you've heard me talk about before, um, this before, you'll be very familiar with. So 
really the, the point is that despite being well behaved, despite uh, SVO word order and head initial syntax, um, you end up with these, these verb auxiliary um, order in certain contexts. And I'm not gonna talk about the context in detail here today, because I've, I've talked about that in lots of other places, but essentially it's the future tense. Um, it's an immediate future tense, which is the example you have in one, and then a more general future tense, which is what you have in example two. And they're formed with two different auxiliaries. Um, I analyze the auxiliary in one as an immediate future auxiliary, um, and the other one um, conveys this a general future. Um, and here, interestingly, you have the verb before the auxiliary. So plant before the inflected auxiliary, open, before the inflected auxiliary. The kind of crucial point here, if you're thinking of your standard SVO word order um, type things, is not just that this is the order, um, but that this is the only uh, possible order. So an attempt at having pre-verbal auxiliary placement, an attempt at having the auxiliary before the verb results in an unacceptable, ungrammatical construction. So this would, be the this would be the order you would expect in, um, in Swahili, for example, it would be the equivalent order you would expect in a language like English. And actually it's also the order that you find in Rangi in other tense um, aspect combinations and in certain syntactic constructions. So this is a not a kind of pragmatically motivated thing, at least not, um, um, not, um, not, not a kind of in present day use. Um, but this is the structure to form, you know, let's say the general tense and uh, general and immediate future tenses. Um, so um, this is unusual in the context of East African Bantu. So as I said, you know, Swahili, but other Bantu languages where auxiliary verb order predominates. Um, but it's also unusual from a typological perspective. So SVO languages the world over are expected to exhibit this pre-verbal auxiliary um, placement, and this is kind of noted as, you know, by Greenberg and, and others as well. So that was, again, my sort of starting point, what's going on there. Maybe this is something to do with language contact. Um, and um, we actually know that Rangi is not alone amongst Bantu languages exhibiting this order. Um, and there are at least five other languages um, that have this order as a regular part of their tense aspect system, right? So again, it's not, okay, some flexibility of word order, or you can do this but this is also how you form you know, a variety of, of tenses in other, in other languages um, as well. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details and the data from the other languages. And I know one of the, the reading group sessions we had, we actually looked at a, a paper I've worked on where highlighted it in six languages. Um, and so here actually Rangi is in, in the purple, so it's sort of central Tanzania. Um, and then in Bugwe, that's the next one up. Um, so spoken in a non-contiguous, um, area, but still in the same kind of area of Tanzania. And then you have these other four languages where you also find this verb auxiliary order um, up more sort of on the Kenya-Tanzania border, up near Lake Victoria, um, the kind of Mara, Mara region. Um, and so what I did in previous work is, although I was interested in it from a contact um, perspective, I've spent many years uh, deciding that it wasn't the result of language contact, but that you could account for it on the basis of a language internal process of, of change, of grammaticalization. Um, and again, I'm only going to kind of gloss over the, the details here and you, you can, uh, you know, some of you here today have discussed this um, earlier on in the year or have read, read the paper, um, but I sort of propose these stages of, of change for this word order how you end up with verb auxiliary being the kind of standard now present day um, future tense construction um, from uh, auxiliary verb order in the past. Having said that, all taking place against the backdrop of high levels of multilingualism and language contact that we know characterize, um, characterize this area and characterize the area in which Rangi is spoken. So my starting point was this unusual feature. Um, so this is my, my word order. Um, and then identification of this um, in a wider number of languages. Um, so actually from the outset, when I started work on Rangi, I, I knew that this had been noted by, in the work by Martin on, on Mbugwe. Um, and actually the other four languages I identified sort of by, by chance. So I was reading a dissertation, fantastic dissertation by um, Johnny Walker, who'd done some work on these Mara languages and then kept on kind of mentioning other languages and it, the net kept on getting wider and wider. So an interesting thing for our purposes, perhaps, is that these are all spoken in areas of sustained language contact, but with different contact languages and different language families, so Nilotic as well as Cushitic. Um, 
and it's not the suggestion that there was a single, you know, contact language. Um, so yeah, that was the sort of that was the story that I I spun in a kind of um, a bridge version there. So my question, sort of following on from there, is well, you wouldn't expect to find that alone if that was contact um, based, and even if we're taking a perhaps more typological approach. Are there other features which might reflect language contact or which cause the language to stand out? What else, you know, can we can we look for? Um, so there's a few other things I want to just um, talk about briefly um, today. I think I've got three features I'm going to um, uh, talk about. Um, so again, this is this was actually based on joint work with um, Vera Wilhelmsen um, a few years ago, where we looked at negation uh, in Rangi and Mbugwe, um, and the examples here are from from Rangi. Um, so it says sentential negation is indicated through the presence of this negative marker C. So this appears before the verb form and then this negative marker tuku, which can appear either post verbally, either meaning immediately after the verb or clause finally. So in four, you have negative come negative, but in five, you also have an intervening um, object. And actually in five, if you're paying close attention or you've seen this example before, you actually know this is an example of the auxiliary um, verb order. So negation is an order in which that verb auxiliary in the previous construction turns around. But here you have the object. So you have the tuku marker clause finally, rather than intervening um, before eggs, for example, immediately after the, after the verb. Um, and a similar, a similar structure is found in, in closely related Mbugwe. And so in the paper, um, Vera and I noted these kind of parallel um, or parallelisms perhaps um, between the formation of negation in Rangi and Mbugwe. But interestingly, um, at least on the basis of her data in Mbugwe, this clause final marker um, is optional. So it performs some kind of emphatic function. So in six, it's something like we did not run to the hospital at all. You could you know, if I've understood correctly, say we did not run to the hospital without the, the toko at the end, but this kind of emphatic, you know, we didn't run to hospital at all, comes from the addition of that final um, clause, final negative marker. Um, so again, you know, why am I sort of talking about this? Well, people notice that, or there's actually lots of work on, on negation in, in Bantu, and that Bantu languages use a wide range of strategies to encode negation. Um, main clause sentential negation is most commonly marked verb internally, but not only. Uh, it's just that that's mean, sort of where it's most widely um, observed. And then in that context, two positions are available for this kind of verb internal marking. So pre-initial position before a subject marker, and then a post-initial position after a subject marker, but albeit still within this verb form. Some languages mark negation in a post-verbal position, um, and again, people sort of said these are also historically associated with like non-main clause contexts. Um, so relative clauses are kind of quite widespread and that's also up until uh, present day. So again, there's been quite a lot of work on non-main negation in non-main clauses and what this, what this looks like. So what we have in Rangi though, is this sort of two, you know, bipartite um, negation construction. Um, and so the analysis that we forward is that this negative marker C is a reflex of a proto-Bantu pre-initial negative marker, fine. So that's kind of reconstructed. Um, and also Kamba Muzenga suggested that Rangi was indeed um, amongst these languages where the negative marker had um, sh sort of shifted from one form to this um, kind of T or C form. Um, so that's the one, that's the pre-negative, uh, sorry, pre-verbal negative marker. Um, and post-verbal negation is found in several Bantu languages, including several Bantu languages from East Africa. So it's not remarkable in that respect. Um, but again, with, with Vera, what we propose is that the actual form of this post-verbal negative marker tuku um, is innovative and it has its origins in Cushitic. Um, and here we draw obviously on work from, from others uh, on both Alagua and Burungay where these are contact languages from Rangi, where there are these modifiers um, that express something like all or whole or kind of totality, particularly of an action or completeness of an action. Um, and so, sorry, that should say lexical borrowing. So the proposal is that tuku or toko are instances of lexical borrowing from these Cushitic languages, um, and that that is indeed an instance of language contact. Um, and that, you know, again, the sort of more details on, on that, if you're particularly interested in the uh, argument there. Um, so what we would sort of say is that 
The marker was used originally to convey emphasis, so this reflects a kind of widespread grammaticalization path um, in the Jesperson cycle, and that's still what you see in Mbugwe. So you remember that example of we did not run to the hospital at all. You still have this emphatic marker, um, but in Rangi it grammaticalized to be now just a standard bipartite negation structure. A missing tuku in Rangi renders the sentence ill-formed in a standard um, main cause negative construction. Um, so again, thinking slightly more about the socio-historical context, the process may have been aided by first language Alagua or Burungay speakers using Rangi, and there is kind of relatively high levels of, of fluency in, in Rangi or high levels of contact perhaps between these communities. Um, and then also perhaps facilitated by the acceptance and the widespread presence of post-verbal negation strategies across East African Bantu. So it wouldn't have seemed like a very sort of unusual or striking feature. Um, and, you know, it's always uh, difficult to identify the kind of direction, but also I suppose Rangi speakers with some knowledge of Alagua or Burungay could have also borrowed the lexical item for emphatic purposes. You don't need to know much of a language to take something like at all or, com you know, completeness marker or something and bring that into the language. And then again, being involved in that, in that Jesperson cycle, um, that kind of grammaticalization process. So kind of building you know, what the story I'm trying to build here is that we're looking at individual features. The first sort of early work that I did was on this, this word order in particular, and then sort of looking at negation and saying, well, there's something a bit odd there. You know, this two part, this bipartite negation strategy seems to be a little bit odd, a little bit different. You know, is that something to do with language contact? And actually, we argue, you know, both with Vera and then also work more recently with, with Lutz Martin that, yes, that is contact, but that is contact of form, right? So that is contact lexical borrowing rather than, for example, um, borrowing of a, of a structure, um, essentially because you don't need to borrow the structure necessarily. Um, widespread use of that kind of construction from a, from a typological perspective. So I have two more examples of, of kind of mini case studies, if you want, that I want to talk about in terms of these kind of striking unusual features. Um, and again, I think I've you know, talked about these in, in different forums before. So Rangi exhibits an inclusive exclusive distinction in first person plural possessive pronouns. Um, so sorry, the alignment's a little bit out, like, out there, but the example should show you the difference between uh, seven and eight. Today, I angered our grandfather. The one in seven, I'm talking to you and I mean our grandfather, but it's not your grandfather as, as well. Right, so it's me and my um, cousins and siblings, I suppose, grandfather, but not you, the person I'm talking to. Um, in contrast, in eight, um, you know, I think I've just come back from Condoa where I went to a, a funeral. The death of our relative in Condoa, you that I'm talking to is included. So this is the inclusive form. And as you can see, this has a different form. So it's we too and we sui. So our including you um, as, the, as the interlocutor, as the, as the hearer, essentially. So this, again, is one of those features that struck me as unusual as someone who'd, for example, studied Swahili, looked at other Bantu languages. This was not something I'd seen um, more widely. Um, in terms of the kind of morphosyntax, clusivity is not marked on the verb or in absolute personal pronouns. So it is just this first person plural possessive pronoun form that does this. There's not a different verb form and there is not a different word for we, so there's not an inclusive we and an exclusive we, like you have in some languages with occlusivity distinction. As I said, occlusivity distinction not attested um, widely in, in well, in neighbouring Bantu languages that I've come across, uh, and indeed not in Bantu languages more widely, uh, it's not very common uh, um, at all it seems. Um, although interestingly there was some reconstruction um, uh, for kind of proto-Bantu, which suggested that there is actually a complexity of first-person plural forms. So, you know, not a distinction, but maybe multiple, multiple forms. So again, as someone who is looking at kind of uh, contact and or trying to find <laughs> and trying to look at contact, I was wondering, is this a contact feature? Um, and I think, again, the kind of conclusion here is that actually it's also not found in any of the neighbouring non-Bantu languages. And again, there may well be people here who have um, examples or know non-Bantu languages in the area that do mark that distinction. If so, that would be fantastic to hear about it because it would add to the picture. Um, 
But I suppose this shows you a kind of third option, which is actually just an independent innovation. So this is some innovation um, in Rangi, perhaps a, a hangover um, from this kind of complexity of first person plural forms that were reconstructed for Protobantu, but perhaps also just uh, an innovation, um, which again, typologically, cross-linguistically, inclusivity, not that unusual, but quite unusual um, from a kind of regional and uh, genealogical perspective. Um, and then the, the final um, case study, the final mini example I have um, here is from work with um, joint work with Aisha Balkhadi. And we've been looking at diexis or the marking of diectic particles, the marking of diexis in Rangi. Um, and there's these three diectic particles. Um, and so the, you have something like nine and 10, I'm going to the river. And then you can put this tour here, which is like, I'm going to the river to wash there. So you're going somewhere else and the action of washing is taking place at a different location. Um, the same in 10, tomorrow I'll go and collect the millet, but not just collect the millet, but collect the millet there at this other place. So this kind of tour um, diectic, you know, at a location away from the diectic center. Um, so that's the, that's the analysis we have there. Um, so that's the story that, that Aisha and I have, have put on that. Um, the examples again have been noted before. So Oliver Stegen also noted these, these forms. Um, so this is the tour marker. So somewhere else going there. Um, there's also jaw. So you will be caught at any time. And my sort of understanding of this is you will come to be caught. Um, so there may well be actually a bit of a kind of metaphorical extension there as well um, for kind of marking the future tense. But so this will like you will come or here to be caught. Um, and then the third one is is core. So there's this kind of three way uh, distinction, the three markers kind of interact. Um, so again, something the, the core, she has gone to the mill to have the corn ground there. Um, in times of old, father used to go and clear the bush there again. So the, the core and the tor um, closely related to each other and the jaw being the other one, which is more like a inventive marker movement towards the center. So this is a, this three-way marking of diexis is, it seems quite restricted um, in Bantu languages. So um, with work with Rosen Gawa and Bastin Person, we've done a study of actually associated motion um, across Bantu languages. And there's a few languages that have a three-way distinction. Um, from an East Africa perspective, Digo has a three-way distinction. So that's interesting, albeit geographically quite far away. Um, so although the system is quite unusual, we actually, argue that you can make an account of each of the markers independently following quite widely established cross-linguistic pathways of change. So core somehow related to the, the ka narrative or consecutive marker um, seen in lots of languages, um, duo coming from the verb to come, again, widespread cross-linguistic um, grammaticalization pathway for inventive marker. Um, and I think also Vera noted a uh, inventive construction perhaps with ja um, in Mbugwe, um, and then to suggested that is grammaticalized from the verb eater, which is go. So individually, you can make a story that these all work in expected ways, perhaps, um, but together they form this pattern, which is quite, um, quite unusual, or the kind of three-way distinction is unusual. So I have a little bit of an interim summary here. So what I've tried to present is four features which on first glance at least, caused Rangi to stand out from a comparative perspective. So the word order, which was really what I first started looking at, um, this clause final negation marker, occlusivity distinction, and the presence of diectic particles. And what I'm trying to argue is that you need a detailed examination and understanding of each feature to better understand its origins. So if you just look at the bipartite negation, you think, oh, that is actually a bit unusual. We see it in some languages, but it's not very widespread. Clusivity, again, seems very um, kind of unique. And so my question here is to really how best to assess these features in terms of this typicality, and then how to find other features if we want to understand how is, how similar, how different is Rangi, you know, in a broader context, all of these so far really have been identified through chance. So, okay, verb auxiliary order I set out to look at, but it's a bit like finding a needle in a haystack. You're just hoping that you find structures um, and that requires you know, patience and some luck as well as actually just quite a lot of knowledge of how the language works as a baseline. So the next thing I want to talk about is um, the Bantu morphosyntactic variation database, 
which again, some of you will have heard me talk about in a different context, and I'm trying to bring these, um, these together really. So the background to, to this work was um, work by um, Lutz Martin, um, Nancy Kula, and Antoine Fatwala, um, who had this paper looking at what they called parameters of, of variation for five languages. And things like, you know, is an object marker obligatory? Um, can you have multiple object markers? Um, stuff to do with relative clauses, agreement, locative inversion, and things like that. And they had a um, binary division, so yes and no. All the answers had to be yes and no. And this was done manually initially, so this is a table. Actually, they have more, more parameters that are not here, I think. Um, you have a do it manually, have it on a, you know, a table, and then you can look at um, similarities and, and differences. So they can look at shared percentage values between these languages based on, yes, 15 parameters and some of their subparameters. And so this reads like a, uh, one of those distance maps when you're in the car and you're working out how far it is between two towns. So how far is it between Chewa and Swahili? How far is it between Bemba and Herero? And so on and so on. You can see the percentages. And what they then did with just these five languages is uh, mapped it onto, um, oops, sorry, mapped it, got my circles, mapped it um, onto the geographic space in which you find these languages, right? So looking at shared similarities between um, Swahili and Chewa, you won't necessarily be able to see the, the figures here, but what languages group most closely together? And there were higher percentages, for example, between Swahili and Bemba and Chewa, than were, there were between Herero and Siswati, which is only 40, for example. And then try and put a kind of historical, socio-historical context and explanation um, alongside that to make sense of these, these similarities. Um, so what happened after that? Um, um, and I suppose, well, just sort of say why you might want to do this. So studying things in slightly more systematic way, um, they argue helps you to better understand underlying reasons for variation and similarity. So is it to do with genetic relatedness? Is it to do with borrowing, which is some of the things I looked at for Rangi? Um, aerial diffusion, um, to what extent of it is variation constrained by universal constraints? And of course, just, just chance as well. So sort of better understanding really um, of, of human language and, and why things change in the way they do. So the, the next sort of step after that, um, was this uh, project, which many of you have heard about, Morphosyntactic Variation in Bantu Typology, Contact and Change, which ran for, for four years. And one of the outcomes of this was a database um, and a set of uh, parameters. So what we did was developed 142 descriptive parameters, each with possible values. These weren't binary. So some of them were binary, but some of them have seven possible values. The aim was to get a sample um, of two to three languages per, um, per zone, the Bantu zones, um, and then put these into a database which was built for these purposes. And then you can create reports and, and maps and things like that, and the parameters are available um, online. And we now actually have a DRI and things as, as well. Um, the parameters, I, I won't at all really talk in detail about what the parameters were, but they fall into these kind of subgroups. So they are things to do with nouns and verbs and uh, syntax and word order and focus and things like that. Um, and we broadly thought that about 80% of them, or 80 of them, sorry, related to nominal and verbal morphosyntax. And then slightly fewer looked at kind of broader clausal topics and clausal morphosyntax. Um, we've actually for a few years now had workshops in, in various places. So this was a workshop looking at the parameters with colleagues at the University of Dar es Salaam. Um, so this was yeah, working through the parameters, different data from different languages, um, what, what works, trying to understand how the questions are applied. Um, and yeah, this is another friendly uh, photo of, of, of some of us. Um, and so what I want to do now, and this is really I don't have conclusions. So this is the kind of final bit and I want to really open the kind of, open the discussion really is take that and then do that um, for Rangi. So in the database at the moment, we have data for about 40 languages with what we have decided is a cutoff for good coverage. So that's 80% of the data points or above. So for 142 parameters, we have information for 80% of those. And there's actually lots of data on many more languages, but then like one parameter or five parameters. So I haven't included those um, for today's purposes. Um, preliminary results, as you might ex expect, suggest that some features are clustered geographically, um, but others, others are not. 
Um, and I have done a few things. So um, this is just a screenshot of, of the database um, and you can go in and you can do sets and you can uh, produce reports and you can have groups of languages and groups of parameters. Um, the next few, they're quite small, so you might not really be able to see what, what the information is, but this is again now using the database function. This is like that roadmap that we had with, with the five languages from the 2007 study. So this is percentage similarity, percentage distance um, between um, various languages. This is a set of 19 East African languages. So we can make a subset of the languages in that group. And then I have used that um, to try and provide some questions for um, today. So this is what I've called an East African languages um, set. So there's broadly, it's just languages that happen to be in the database, which are broadly spoken in Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, and actually there's a couple in, in Mozambique as well. And that's quite interesting from a kind of comparative perspective. Again, we haven't got any languages here that have coverage of lower than 80% of the data points. So as you can see, we, well, yeah, here we have 100% of data for Gikuyu, um, for Swahili and for Chindamba, and then we have kind of lower numbers, but pretty good coverage for the others. Um, there's some percentages you can do. So you can get this kind of weighted average. So like how similar are they? And we can talk about that in the discussion section about really what that, um, what that means. But of this East African languages group, it, in a way, it doesn't matter what the numbers are, but you can see here that they're kind of, they're all, <laughs> all broadly similar. So these are all in the sort of um, 50s and, and 60s, and I'll talk about that um, in a second. So what I did is I put these languages on the, um, on the sort of, actually, this is now just an Excel sheet, but it's, it's generated the same thing, this distance map, um, and I've highlighted um, percentage similarities for, for Rangi, and then looked at how that is similar and different for other languages um, in this East African set as well. So again, I don't expect you to be able to see, see or make sense of the numbers, um, but what I just pulled out are some things that I thought were interesting and perhaps unexpected. So the highest shared percentages, this is now Rangi, so back to kind of what I was talking about at the beginning, is with Chindamba, um, and then Yao and Mbugwe, Mbugu, um, sorry, Mbugu, not Mbugwe, um, both have 64%, um, and then Swahili and Nyoro, 62%. Other languages in this East Africa group have lower than 60% similarity, so there was like 57 and 58, and I haven't um, pulled that um, out necessarily. Um, lowest shared similarity was with Chwabo, which was 49%, and that's spoken in Mozambique, so again, geographically quite far away and probably expected. And the highest percentage similarity overall for East Africa as a whole, and East Africa includes these Mozambican languages, is between Chabo and Sena, which was 80%. So again, just to show you that actually the range there is only between, you know, it's not actually a huge, huge sort of um, area of, of, well, it's not a huge range, essentially. Um, so as I say, that's more sort of, you know, questions really rather than, than conclusions. But what I tried to, to do is provide some kind of, so I had these kind of four case studies of some features of Rangi Morpho syntax at the beginning, which I've, I and with other people have examined in quite a lot of detail and tried to make sense of, all of which to some extent caused the language to kind of stand out and then argue that you need a closer examination to better understand the structures and the origins. Then, you know, very briefly talked about the, the Bantu Morpho syntactic database and the kind of patterns that you might be able to identify using this approach. And first impressions, if you think that 65% suggest that it's quite similar, imply that these languages are quite similar, imply actually that Rangi is quite similar to those other languages found in East Africa. And then really the question is, what does that actually mean? Um, and then, you know, sort of <laughs> conclusions, but these are conclusions then more about the methodology than the results. So if you do this kind of feature by feature approach, you can come up with a quite a detailed story. It's quite time consuming. So you need a lot of data and you need to understand the picture. And it's quite complex because you need to understand, well, what is a possible parallel feature in Alagua or Burungay or in other Bantu languages? Um, you perhaps get a richer and fuller picture. And I wonder if it's more convincing. So providing a step-by-step -step account of a grammaticalization pathway is perhaps a bit more convincing. 
And of course, you have a fr the freedom to choose what you're going to focus on. So I can focus on negation. Um, with a database, you can compare a much larger data set kind of instantly, um, as long as you have the data in there, which we now do, and you can get a quite quick snapshot of similarities and differences, at least in terms of percentages. Um, there's also a map feature, which I didn't show you there before, but then it's still quite difficult to understand, well, how or where does this variation arise? Like what is causing it? What does it mean? And you are of course restricted by the features that are in the parameters and then by virtue of that in the database. Um, and so my last sort of point really is what you might do with this kind of thing. So I think you need to do both, right? So a closer examination of specific features, ideally with more data, but then you can also use the database, you know, a next step would be to use the database to drill down to see where the variation lies. So I've just said, you know, Rangi and Chundamba have, what was it, 64% similarity. Actually, you could look and say that similarity is in clausal morphosyntax or that similarity is in the nominal domain or it is in the verbal domain. You could do that either with individual parameters or you can do that with subsets of parameters, these kind of groupings. Um, and I think really, well, the kind of work that I'm interested in doing, it's, it's kind of the balance between combining them both. And then of course, and a lot of the work that's been done by, by this group is then you need that alongside the relevant socio-historical and indeed socio, you know, present day social context as well to then make sense of it. Otherwise you just have these floating parameters or floating features without a story um, to go with them. So I think that's it for me. I think I've just got a thank you slide for, for all of you and then for, for many people that I've discussed um, some of these uh, topics with um, over the years. Great, thank you very much, Hannah, for your presentation. Uh, I think we can now begin the question and answer section. If anyone would like to ask a question or offer a comment, you can do so using the Zoom chat window or by using the raise hand function in the participants window. I will go ahead and start with my own question to give other participants some time to write or formulate their comment or question. So first I have a couple of comments. Uh, one is that Hadza, which is a language isolate spoken somewhat close by in Tanzania, uh, does have clusivity in the pronouns, uh, not just the possessive pronouns, but uh, all of the pronouns. Um, the only other interesting thing I noticed uh, similar to another language I've worked on is uh, the Jo and To uh, uh, didactic constructions just reminded me a lot of uh, ventive and idive constructions in nilotic, but uh, wouldn't necessarily propose that that was due to contact, but just uh, an interesting parallel. Fantastic, thanks. Particularly the Hadza stuff, I didn't know, so that's really helpful. Or if yeah. I did know, I've, I've forgotten it. So I can add that there is clusivity in the region. Um, whether that changes you know, the analysis or not, I don't know, but that's, yeah, that's really helpful. Um, and then nilotic, yeah, certainly. Um, both, um, I think that's, yeah, quite widely kind of uh, noted. Yeah. Well, I will go ahead and let Martin ask a question. So hold on. There, Martin, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yes, I have, I think, unmuted myself and maybe also unveiled myself. <laughs> but then I have to turn my face. <laughs> uh, thank you, Anna. Very inspiring uh, presentation. And of course, I have many, uh, many points I would like to raise, but maybe start with the last one, with the comparison um, in the database. Uh, I, I see the, the biggest com uh, potential in, the, in those databases is to see, to check whether you get re, uh, recurrent um, uh, related uh, changes, variation. Um, that, uh, that, that if you have this kind of change, what we were looking for maybe a long time ago with the, with the Greenberg typology projects, like if you do this, then uh, implicational kind of uh, related uh, parameters. What, what you are doing, um, I would be interested in, in seeing whether some of the, the historical proposals uh, are reflected in, in those comparison. So Rangi is uh, in the F30 group, but I mean, uh, 
Nurse and Philipson have, mm -hmm. have hinted several times that it, it is quite deviant there, and it seems to have links with Chaga and possibly Pare. So that, that, that to me would be interesting to, to see what, what you can find uh, between those. And, and you're looking uh, primarily at, uh, at morphosyntactic uh, features, of course, because those are in the database, but for this contact, contact would yeah, nearly always change, uh, became start in the lexicon, so it would be really nice to, uh, to be able to link these things with uh, kind of lexical links. And for the lexical links, mm, I, I would be very interested in Bondé, because, because there we know that there is the, the caravan trade from uh, the Swahili are called Vabonde in Rangi. So we, we, it would be nice to see a sort of link there. I was looking at a word for tobacco uh, recently, and there I noticed that Rangi stands out in the region, that it has the word uh, Itombe too, whereas all the languages in that area have a final E, except maybe Sandawe. Um, um, and so um, that could be uh, a link with the Ceuta area of, uh, where Bondé is. So I, I, I would be uh, uh, interested in, in yeah, seeing what is going on where you, where you, for either reasons where you know that there are already ideas of, of uh, linguistic contact or where you know that there are ideas of uh, of historical context to to look at those. Yeah, th thank you. I think, yeah, one of the other, I suppose it's a, a caveat, but of course, yeah, we only at the moment have the data that we have for the languages, you know, the only, the languages that are in the database are what I was doing the final work on. So we could of course target other languages that we thought, oh, it would be really helpful to have, you know, this language in there from a comparative perspective or looking for a particular feature. For the lexical work, we've actually um, submitted a, a, a proposal to do some joint work with Rebecca Grollemund, who has a very extensive then, you know, lexical database, I think, with information for over, I think it's 400 languages. And so the early work where people did a lot of comparative work was primarily based on the lexicon and then grouped languages together. So the, the interesting question there is, do you get the same groupings and trees and things like that if you do it for morphosyntax as you do for the lexicon? And, and what does that tell us? So if they're the same, that tells us one thing. If they're different, you know, is it to do with uh, ways in which languages are yeah, transmitted and, and learnt, impact on, on contact and things like that? So I think the lexical work is a like the comparison really between the, or the combination of the lexical and the morphosyntax would be really uh, interesting. So hopefully in a few years time we'll be able to answer those questions as well. Okay, then I see we have a, a comment from Roland Kiesling in the chat. Uh, he says, thanks a lot, Hannah, and observation. The category of directional markers, Joe and Co. reminds me of the associated locomation category in Datoga. Uh, so this is similar to my comment earlier. Uh, where you get a contrast of uh, verb odd to verb while moving thither or moving to move thither uh, versus verb on to verb while moving hither or and move hither. But in Datoga, there's no indication as to the lexical source of the marker in contrast to your findings for Rangi. Yeah, I think we're, I think we're lucky in that respect in that, um, you know, at least for the time being, I'm quite sort of happy with the account of the lexical source and that fits the story and, and the, the distribution and, and the, what seem to be the uses. Um, the actual use of associated, you know, locomotion, associated motion, directionals, that to me still seems to be quite marked or quite unusual. So I think I said like, Digo has a three-way distinction um, there might be another language, but we found, so lots of Bantu languages just have like the ka, um, so go and, or go and then, or verb and. Some have the ventive, so the come and, but this kind of three forms um, seems to be sort of, so it, it, again, it's that is the, the forms we can make a story for and the lexical origins, but that overall picture then 
is still one that seems to be um, kind of un unusual. Um, I don't know actually in, in Mbugwe if we have, so I, I know Vera and I think maybe Martin, we've spoken about it, the, the kind of ja, the, the ventive one, but I don't know if there are other forms as well. So that being the kind of most closely um, related to Rangi, that would be interesting as well. Then also a comment from Wizzy Pool. Uh, she said that she'd been wondering what the E2 Isui difference was for a while. So thank you for solving that. But that's great. I, I assume that Lizzie is talking about in. Oh, well, yeah, I get in Rangi, is it Lizzie? <laughs> um, because, yeah, that was I had a very clear, you know, speaker very clearly describing that difference to me. But I it seemed to me very strange that it had, you know, it, I hadn't got a story of where it had come from. Um, yes. Yep. Um, so people were exactly trying to explain to me this this story of like, no, 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 it would be, you know, we, it would be ours, but not yours. And of course, translating that into Swahili, you have to do the same as you do in English, right? Like mine, but not yours. It's, it's sort of, um, so, so yeah, I thought I've had that explained quite, quite clearly, I think, but yeah, um, it'd be interesting if there's other data out there as well. Now I'll follow up with a question of my own. Um, I'm curious as to whether or not you were surprised to see the percentages that you guys got. Because um, uh, there's oftentimes this idea that Bantu is fairly homogenous. Mm -hmm. So you might expect to see uh, most of the percentages in the 90s, for example. But what you found was actually strikingly different. There was uh, a range of different percentages. Was that what you expected? Uh, it wasn't what I expected, but then it's a really good question because I also don't really know what it means, right? So to have numbers in the 60s and some as low as, you know, of course, the, the parameters that we came up with are parameters of Bantu morphosyntactic variation, right? So they are questions that we were asking that were already based on things that we know about for the most part, right? So we knew to ask about object marking, you know, variation in object markers and things like that. So I think there's a slight risk there um, that we asked about things that we know about. Um, if you compare that to some of the numbers or percentages you would get if we went to like the Northeast, uh, sorry, the Northwest, then you would see it's very different. So those are much less similar, but yeah, in a way you might've expected them to be up there in the, as you say, you know, eighties and nineties. And, um, and it would be good to then look much more closely at where that variation comes from. So yeah, the parameters are primarily morphosyntactic, but there is like, there's a couple that are lexical just because they, you know, every now and then you need a, you need a break or a question that you can just say yes or no to. Um, I, I think I, I don't have an explanation as to why Rangi and Chindamba are the similar ones. So I perhaps would have expected lots of languages to be similar and then I don't know Swahili to be different or something you need to kind of go the next step which is like well how do I explain that and I haven't quite worked that out um, it doesn't seem to be obviously like you know aerial at least on these languages and of course there are gaps right so I haven't got all of the languages that then are in the intervening physical space as well right all of the languages that would take you to get to Twabo or Sena or whatever so that would be um, needed for a real kind of robust um, explanation, I think. Great, thanks, very interesting. Uh, I think we'll move on to Lizzie Poole, who has raised her hand. So Lizzie, you're welcome to ask your question now. Um, yeah, so it's not a question, it's just, um, I think what interested me about the 60% or roughly that um, was not particularly, as you said, like, does that mean they're similar or not? We don't really have any way of, of yeah. making a, um, a judgment on that at the moment. But I think what interested me was that they were all similar. So there wasn't anything that was particularly more weird than anything else. Um, lots of what I've read about Rangin and Wugwe are highlighting how different they are to languages, um, other F30 languages, whereas seeing that they're all roughly 60 is like, well, okay, maybe they're not particularly more weird than anything else is. Um. Yeah, I think that is a really good point. And actually, I think that relates to, there's a question from Andrew in the, in the chat as well about the group as a whole. 
And I do think that that's slightly where what we were asking influences this, right? So some mm. of the parameters say, you know, how is negation marked? Is it in the pre-initial or the post-initial position? Um, you know, is there an applicative marker? You know, how are passive or by phrases introduced in passives? Lots of these languages, the answer would be the same, right? So it's introduced by a preposition. Yes, there's an applicative. You know, it's only when you get certain things that are very different that those differences stand out. So, of course, because I worked on it, there is a question asking, can you have verb auxiliary order? But of our, you know, 100 languages, there are, you know, five or six in the database where we have yes, and everything else is just consistently no. So in a way, you need to know more about the ways in which languages change at vary in order to then be able to ask the right questions about how similar languages are. Um, so if we ask lots of questions about negation and, and noun classes and diminutives and verbal morphology, they all probably still look quite similar. So yeah, I think actually that sort of answers what Rich asked earlier on. In a way, it is surprising. Um, Thanks, Jessamy. This is a great time to go to Andrew's question then. So he, he writes that the Guthrie classifications obviously have their built-in issues and biases. And he's wondering, how do you feel about Bantu group F, both in terms of a group and then also Rangi's place within it? Yeah, I have to, I have to confess that even as someone who works on Bantu languages, I don't spend a lot of time thinking and talking about the, the groupings. Um, you know, this was a kind of more recent addition to my my thinkings and worryings but I think that was one of the things that was at the back of my mind so this starting point was oh Rangi is going to be really different and even like you know Mbugwe is going to be really different and it's been noted um, as you say you know with with other work I think um, you know Martin mentioned um, Nurse and Philipson you know noticed it does different things does it really belong to this group um and yeah, I mean, maybe we just need to understand things things better. If you if you think of it as a geographic grouping, then I think it's you know I think it's fine. Um, Thanks. And we have a question from Makoto Furumoto and Rangi, which is mainly or which is mainly used in order to encode TAM information, auxiliaries or verbal affixes. It's, yeah, it's a really good question. I don't have a you know like a percentage or an idea from a from a corpus, which I could tell you, this is the most frequent or this is most often used. Um, so the auxiliaries are used for specific tenses. So there's a general future tense, immediate future tense, and then there's a past tense auxiliary construction as well, which also uses the re. And then all the other tense aspect combinations use what would be more familiar, perhaps, especially like Makoto, if you're used to, you know, Swahili or, or something like, um, you know, uh, suffixes for habitual, different past tenses, um, tone, obviously, as well. So probably more affixes, except for these very specific um, auxiliary constructions, compound constructions that are formed using auxiliaries. Um, and it's only these two that have the verb auxiliary order. And then other auxiliary constructions have the more typical uh, auxiliary verb order as well. Great, thanks. And I have another question about the parameters of the typological database. So I assume that a lot of the features were chosen uh, specifically because the project was focused on Bantu languages. So I'm curious when you are looking at contact, can any of these features be used to examine non-Bantu languages? Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I think there's two answers to that. So one is when we first developed the parameters and then the database, we thought it would be nice if they would be transferable. So they would not be Bantu specific. So you could then compare non-Bantu languages as well. And I think Andrew was involved in some of those discussions at that stage. But actually just in, in sheer practical terms, we ended up with at one stage 250 parameters and then had to dial it back to 142. And they are all very you know, Bantu specific. So of course, if you ask, is there a negation particle, then yes, that might be something you can say yes to for lots of other languages. But then when you start asking about noun classes and like diminutive prefixes and things like that, you probably the answer ends up just being like non applicable or zero or whatever. Um, so I think that's, that's one thing that really it doesn't in its current form account for non, it's not designed to account for non Bantu features. 
one of the things I'm interested in is whether we can use this, and that's what I was kind of pointing out perhaps today, to look and see where contact features might be worth looking in more detail, right? So if we look at 142 parameters for Rangi and then say, oh, actually it is mainly in, you know, the, the kind of clause or it's mainly in relation to focus or it's mainly in relation to negation, that this language seems to be different from both maybe other, you know, F group languages, other East African languages, or just you can do, of course, a comparison for like all of Bantu that we have at least in the database. Then you would say, I wonder if that is as a result of, uh, is as a result of you know, influence from Maasai, influence from Datoga. So it's like, I think it's a good starting point, but you can't really, you know, get the database to give you a report which will say, ah, this is a contact feature. Great, thank you. Uh, so we have uh, another comment from Martin Maus. Uh, he says that there's a form Tuku and Maasai for absolutely. Uh, he says that it seems to be reconstructable for nilotic. And then also Yaku, uh, a Cushitic language, has Tuku, just like Rangi and Mbukwe, uh, and they speak Maasai most of the time. Uh, so he, he's wondering, is there any indication of influence from Maasai on these languages? I don't think I have, and certainly not off the top of my head, any other examples from, from Maasai. That's really helpful about the Tuku, though, because I can then add that to my, I mean, that then is much more widespread as well. I can add that to my list. I don't have other examples of influence from Maasai, either kind of linguistic or, you know, kind of more broadly. Um, but it certainly isn't, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very feasible. Um, so, yeah, you get kind of high rangy, as you know, and then the, the other side it is, you know, it is Maasai from there on in, really. So um, it would sort of be expected. But the, I think the at least the, the, the present day and what people were able to tell me and share with me, the they the feeling was that Alagua and Burungay were much more, you know, like neighboring villages. Oh, this person actually, you know, this family member is actually a Burungay and all that kind of thing seemed to me much closer than Maasai. Again, anecdotally, people spoke about that as though it was kind of, you know, much further away and a sort of different area. But um, you may well have a, you know, a, a more more thoughts on that as well. Oh, thanks. I, I see from uh, Wissi, she has another comment that uh, Mbukwe speakers use Dio uh, to mean dog, which she believes is from Maasai. Uh, and Rohan Kiesling writes uh, that the Datoga cognate for Tuk would be Duk, which is attested as a verb meaning cover, metaphorically expanded, um, a metaphorically expanded source of regionally widespread idiophone Tuk, meaning all in totality. Oh, fantastic. I think that's just another another one to add to the to the Tuku story then, isn't it? I think. Yeah. Well, I think uh, now that we're at the top of the hour, this is uh, probably all the time that we have for questions and answers today. Uh, but I'd like to thank everyone for participating. Uh, after this, we're going to start the Wikipedia Editathon for November. Before that, though, first I'd like to tell you about the next presentation in the webinar series, which will be given on Wednesday, November 18th by Festo Masani. This talk will explore riddles in the South Cushitic language Gorwa, and it will be given in Swahili. Uh, so again, I'd like to thank everyone for participating today and Hana for giving her wonderful presentation. And I hope to see you again at our next webinar. Thanks everyone.